Hi everyone, I'm really excited to have a special guest here to discuss autism and suicide prevention. Um, and how did you become interested in suicidality? And are there areas of autism and suicidality that you're most interested in learning about in the future? Yeah, definitely. So I was like, suicide work was not like not on my radar. I was in grad school and getting my degree in psychology. And I had to pick, I had to like become a research assistant and pick a lab. I'm, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And one of the um, PhD students was like, yeah, come to our lab, the suicide prevention lab. And like, it's great. You'll love it. So I went and it was amazing. And I say it was amazing because um, suicide prevention is all about like getting facts and information and like solving problems and like being autistic. Like, yes, I'm like, yes, so we can solve something. Um, and so I'm working in Dr. Job's lab at the Catholic University of America. And that's where I'm doing my own research. And I'm focusing now on LGBTQ plus BIPOC individuals because there is like the research for these groups are like minimal. And these are groups that are really experienced, especially neurodivergent people as well, experiencing um, suicidality. So in answering that question as well, I'm really focused now on neurodivergence as a whole. And so I kind of look at it as a circle where there's suicidality, but we're also looking at homelessness. We're also looking at like high levels of like depression and all of these other things and um, unemployment. So I feel like these are like symptoms of a bigger thing going on in neurodivergence. So that's where I'm focusing on, kind of like the systemic part. Also, I'm really interested in a social historical context of so looking at specifically Black suicidality, which is completely high right now, um, and looking at how like pre-transatlantic slave trade to currently, like how the notion of suicide and like pr presentation changes throughout history. Thank you so much for that answer. That's really interesting. Um, the next, sorry, the next question I have is, what advice would you give to autistic individuals who may be struggling with chronic suicidality? And kind of as part two of that question, what are some strategies that might help autistic individuals um, who are struggling to find more, you know, self-acceptance, peace, or hope? Yeah. Um... So <laughs> I'm not a fan of like giving advice because it's opinion-based versus fact-based. But in like speaking with people I know or like speaking with my friends, I would say like what you are feeling, your emotions, your experience is completely valid. And so this pain that you have is valid. And so I want you to know that there are people like me and others who are working and who are here to support you because we believe in you, because we believe in this work. And so you're not alone. Um, and we're here to sit with you like through this like cloud. Um, the second part of the question, can you repeat it? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of wondering about strategies that might especially help autistic people find self-acceptance or peace. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, maybe kind of tap into autistic strengths a little bit. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Um, so for me personally, I am late diagnosed autistic. And I just remember growing up feeling like, why am I an alien? I cannot fit in no matter what I try, no matter what I do. And that was very depressing for me. Um, and so being like learning that I'm autistic and like, whoa, figuring out, finding out more about myself, what's really has been important is unmasking and authenticity, which unmasking is like, we tend to um, follow social norms or try to follow social norms. We tend to fail sometimes. Um, and it makes it, it's hard for us because we're overstimulated and we're all of these kind of things. And so it's about being able to just be you. Like, I'm not looking at the camera right now. I have my stim toy with me. Um, and that brings me autistic joy. That leads to autistic joy. I believe in us having autistic joy and like, my room is pink and I love cartoons and I watch Bluey and like, I love velvet. So I make sure I surround, and like video games, I play the Sims all day. So making sure I'm surrounded by things that just bring me joy. Um, I think for us, I think that's like really important. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I love I love having fidget toys as well <laughs> and meeting people. Um, so, You've written an excellent article on suicidality and autism. And one of your points was about 
um, how it can be helpful for clinicians to use a really direct, concise approach with clients compared to very general questions like, how are you feeling that might be so open-ended that they're potentially confusing? Would you be willing to explain a little bit more about this and why it's beneficial and maybe discuss how clinicians or anyone else supporting autistic individuals can identify whether their questions are accessible and direct or not enough? Yeah, definitely. So there's two kind of folds to the question. So one, autistic people, we have this thing called alexithymia, which is it's hard for us to kind of like feel our emotions or explain what we're feeling. It's kind of like, you know, like the TVs back in like the 90s, 2000, like you turn them on and there's that static thing going on. That's the kind of feeling that we get. It's like static. I can't really tell you what I'm feeling. Um, so when someone asks us a question like, you know, how are you feeling? What are you feeling? I don't know. Like it's static. <laughs> Um, and then the second part to that is we are very good at direct questions, um, in like inferring things and uh, trying to understand things through context is kind of hard. Um, so being direct, um, you know, um, how, when, where, how, like fact base is something that we are more easier to like answer and to understand. And so that kind of goes hand in hand with suicidology and like when you're doing suicide risk assessments because you want to be direct in general when you're asking suicide questions, because you're just really trying to get to the facts. Um, are you having thoughts about suicide? What do these thoughts look like? And so these are the kind of questions that clinicians and people who are working with autistic people um, and suicidal um, picket clients can ask. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, one other point that kind of stood out to me when I was reading your article was an openness to unconventional support systems. I think a lot of times we and maybe clinicians have an idea, a specific idea of what a support system means, um, but autistic individuals might benefit from more extended or unconventional support systems. So do you have any suggestions for if an autistic client says that they want a stronger support system, what some first steps for helping them identify what type of system would be helpful might be? Yeah. So I think understanding, I think this is in general, we're moving away from the nuclear family. So husband, wife, and 2.5 kids. And so now we're at an understanding that what family looks like, what support looks like can be different. Sometimes it's not the family structure. Sometimes it's like found family. So um, looking at friends, especially people in LGBTQ communities, like that's really important. Um, and also autistic people, it's hard for us to make friends. Um, it's hard for us to build community. So our support system might only be our therapist. Um, or another thing is that we're now very good at doing, um, making friends virtually. Um, and so that's something that therapists and clinicians kind of need to look at. It's like, what does the virtual sphere look like for autistic people? So in building support systems with our clients, it's important to kind of talk about um, and look at like unconventional support systems and aut an autistic client can tell you, hey, this is what my support system looked like. Like that's not hard for us. Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I guess based on what you mentioned previously, I'm very interested to learn really anything you're comfortable sharing about uh, autism and, or neurodivergence and homelessness and suicide prevention. Yeah. Um, so what I do understand is and especially this kind of goes hand in hand with like transgender youth, LGBTQ youth um, have higher rates of homelessness. Um, and when you're looking at neurodivergent adults, um, especially like if a caretaker dies or we don't have that support system, there's a higher rate of homelessness. And so um, there's really not, and especially as you become an adult, the resources to getting like support for autism is diminished, like literally diminished. And so a lot of people are struggling. And so there's that increased homelessness. Have you found that there's specific adaptations to suicide prevention that are more effective when, when working with people who are homeless? Um, yeah, so I haven't really done the work with working with homelessness specifically. Um, I have, I used to work at the VA so there's a, uh, I know there's a correlation with homelessness and needing like financial support. So, so there are like some like um, governments and like within cities have who have been doing like financial retribution and like giving money out 
or um, like, you know, having housing. And so that tends to diminish kind of like that, that homelessness crisis. But that homelessness crisis is going along with that housing crisis that we're seeing, the economical crisis. And then we're also looking at autistic individuals. Like a lot of us are underemployed or not employed at all. And so again, that ties into that homelessness. Thank you so much. Um, so kind of the next question that I had for you is, and I know this is probably kind of a broad question, but are there indications of suicide in autistic individuals that are less likely to be recognized by those around them? So I know, for example, in some depression screenings where they've started tailoring them specifically towards autistic individuals, they've added questions related to sensory overwhelm or a sudden loss in um, special interest that people might not typically think of when they're assessing for um, depression. Have you seen any parallels to this with um, suicide prevention as it specifically relates to autism? Yeah, so the examples that you brought up are amazing, excellent. Um, so it depends. And I say that because when we're looking at suicidality and autism, we have to look at sometimes there's a lot of com comorbidities. And so an autistic person who is dealing with autis um, autism and anxiety and depression, that's going to be a higher risk for suicide behavior. Um, autistic people in general um, have higher risks of substance abuse, um, higher risks of self-harm. And so being autistic in itself is a, like a, a risk factor. And then you include all these other components um, and that increases the risk factor. So it's dependent on the individual. Um, and then when you're dealing with that individual looking at intersections of identity, Autistic people who are LGBTQ or BIPOC um, also have higher risk. So it's just incorporating all of that. And so when we're looking at suicidality with autistic people, some of the risks, like when you're looking at the risk factors or when you're looking at symptoms, like you're saying, um, there's that kind of like disconnect from your special interest, like kind of, and that's related to like the depression and stuff like that, that you're going to see. Thank you. Um... And one other kind of autism specific question I have is uh, rumination and repetitive thinking. I know personally I have a lot of rum rumination. I know quite a few autistic people do. Um, but how do you see this as potentially influencing spirals of suicidal thinking? And are there distinct approaches to suicide prevention based on if the person is kind of having this pattern of rumination or not? Yeah, that's a great question because yes, a lot of autistic people do have ruminating thoughts. Um, also, when you factor in and research is looking at um, autistic people, there's a high comorbidity with OCD and OCD tendencies, and then you include that. Um, so it's kind of like a structure where you're kind of like, okay, here's a thought, and then I'm building on this thought, I can't get away from this thought, and then it's like a spiraling, um, which leads to hopelessness, which is like one of Thomas Jr.'s um, theories of hopelessness is like, the higher the hopelessness, the higher the suicidal behavior. Um, and so... I'm not a therapist, but therapists work with that end with the clients in making sure that they do like treatments like mindfulness, um, sometimes ACT, which is like acceptance therapy, um, therapies and treatments that kind of bring one into like the present and reducing those thoughts. And just kind of a very open ended question here, but is there anything that you'd like to add that I haven't asked about? Um... Yeah, I think for one thing, it's community is important to us. Um, finding our individuality is important. And a lot of us need our alone time. And also at the same time, community as in finding people who are like us is important. So there's really not a lot of support for neurodivergent adults. And a lot of the support that there are are from other neurodivergent adults. And so like finding like an online group, if you like D&D, &D, like playing D&D &D on Discord or like um, there's some like autistic.com is like a group that kind of like works with autistic people made by autistic people. Um, that's kind of why I went into consulting and coaching is I'm like, we need support. Um, we need help. We need people to see us. And so I just always think that community can be really important to us. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've never personally played D&D, &D, but I have. It does seem to be a great source of joy for many autistic people I know. It's <laughs> which so is fun. Wonderful. It really is. <laughs> yeah, it sounds yeah. great. Um, well, 
thank you so much for yeah for your time and for sharing some of this information I really appreciate it a lot yeah thank you so much for having me I really enjoyed it